And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight from Wizard Tower Games, who already, ha already have a fair few board and card games under their belt, and our fellow sufferers of the of having winter half the year. But but some of you may know him better as the man known as Don. <laughs> Cur currently developing <laughs> the interstellar role playing game, which we'll be getting into tonight. Not to be confused with the movie. That's a whole other can of worms. How you doing tonight, man? I am doing great, Mildra. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you for coming on. Um, it's a bit of a tradition with newcomers that I always open with the humble beginnings, the origin story, if you will. Mm -hmm. So walk me through your origin when it comes to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, Christmas of 1977 uh, is when I caught the bug, or right after 70, Christmas of 77, I had gotten for Christmas um, the Dungeons and Dragons um, box set. And didn't think anything of it, wasn't impressed with it when I opened it up, to be honest with you. So I handed it to a friend of mine over Christmas break. And uh, we went back to school um, about a week later. And he walked up to me and was like, dude, uh, you, need to, you need to look at this. And I was like, oh, I'm not. Ready. No, no, seriously, you can you can cast spells. We you can do this. This is a game game. So that weekend we sat down and um, I got hooked immediately. All right. And were you mo were you mostly a one system guy o over the years, or did you jump around between other systems? I was strictly D and D. Um, I played a little bit of Star Frontiers. Um, a little bit um, of a couple of the other TSR products of the time that came out, but not much. I was pretty much a one system guy. I was I was basic back me, you know, the box, red box, yep. sets, etc. And um, then once A D and D came out right around well, once once I was exposed to A D and D, which is probably right around 79-ish, 80, um, I went to the I went to Gen Con 79 and that's where I was exposed to AD&D uh, initially. So I started getting into it, and then I started getting really hardcore into AD&D probably in latter part of 80, 81, first part of 81, um, and got really heavy hardcore into that. And then our we had a um, we had an art teacher named Mr. Sepich who created a D&D club because he saw us playing the game. And I guess he played it years before in the old white box and was kind of intrigued with the way it progressed. So we started doing a uh, D&D club and I played the D&D club once every two weeks and me and my friends played it every weekend. Mm -hmm. And with that, now with that in mind, um, I'd like to, Given the fact that I've dipped into a bunch of the hidden gems of, of the TSR era, I'd like to I'd like to play a bit of word association. I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a few names and you tell me if you had dipped into them or if you had only heard of them by name or somewhere in between. Sure. Um we already mentioned Star Frontier, so I can cross that one off the list. That's usually the big one. Yep. Um Boot Hill. Boot Hill. Uh never played it. Metamorphosis Alpha. Had a friend who had it. We never got into it. Gamma World. I that was my main sci-fi when I went to sci-fi. I played. I, I did Gamma World. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see what. Marvel Phase Rip. Never played any superhero stuff. All right. Uh oh. Buck Rogers. Never played the game. Of all of all the ones, Buck Rogers has kind of been my whipping boy for different reasons. <laughs> but <laughs> well, 
My mind, my mindset was who who the hell was going to know who Buck Rogers was in 1988? I mean, the thing is that that's the thing. I mean, I think what they were trying to go off of. I think TSR back in the day, you know, they pretty much wanted to license anything for an RPG. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, it it was it was game for them, and other companies kind of jumped on the bandwagon and do their RPGs and such. Yeah. Um, but I think when the uh, Buck Rogers RPG came out, they're kind of trying to gleam off the you know seventies, eighties, you know Buck Rogers TV show. I think it. I think it's. A, I think it's a little late for that, especially especially when st when the closest the recognizable thing for as far as that kind of pulp SF would probably be stuff like Buckaroo, Bonsai, and Flash Gordon around that time. Yep, agreed. More the latter than the former, because Buckaroo Bonsai was absolutely destroyed due to coming out at the complete wrong time. Wrong time, agreed. Because it was up against the one of the films that came out around that same season that it had to, that it had to contend with. Terminator Two, yep. and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I think it was mm -hmm. either that or Tem or Temple of Doom. But the fact is, you've got two heavy hitters that you're going into the ring with. <laughs> It had no chance. Oh, yeah. and, and the thing is, is you know, those were those were such big heavy hitters also. Yeah. You know? There's so, I mean, they, they, they tried to compete, you know, and I don't think I, they just it just like I said, I think it was all timing. Mm hmm. Uh but um to get back to get back on the lightning round, this will be the this will be the last one of my of my list because the other ones I could I could bring up are way into the weeds. <laughs> um, top secret. Oh, I played top secret. Yes. Um, did you play the original or SI or both? I played the I played the original. Right. SI played, is my I, preference, but that's just me. Yeah, I I got into it. In fact, um, actually, our art teacher, Mr. Sepich, um went ahead and I believe it was second edition sometime right around 81 ish 82 well no it had to be 81 yeah no 81 or 82 second edition I think is what it was that we um that he brought in top secret mm -hmm. and um no we weren't having that we we wanted to play D D. yeah uh and it, as an as an aside I will I will note that one of one of my favorite one of my favorite things when it comes to when it comes to a lot of early early entries of D and D was the Ask the Sage column that was in Dragon. Yeah. Because there's some interesting questions, especially the whole thing of will a magic sh will a magic shield stop a la stop a laser because Expedition to mm -hmm. the Barrier Peaks had come out. Yes. It's not. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks isn't my favorite, but I love throwing that at people when they when they try and use the um. The fan, the um, the idea that you can't mix fantasy and SF, you know, despite the fact that the two have been joined at the hip for longer than longer than we've been alive. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is you know, D and D and and sci-fi, you know, D and D's fantasy, sci-fi is sci-fi, but I think you can go ahead and and bring them in. I mean. I don't see the argument is, I mean, I there's there's even rules set up for it. You know, there's been rules over the years made up, you know, for it. And I know that um, you know, like you said, they mentioned it in Dragon, and they might have touched it in Dungeon also. Yeah, I uh, although my my favorite response to the whole ask the sage thing is the question of whether barbarians eat quiche. Oh jeez. The answer was no. I think it was meant to be a reference to the book Do Barbarians Eat Quiche? Mm -hmm. But if I'm being honest, Quiche gets a bad rap. <laughs> Just I that. actually make it. So, you know. I mean, I mean it's got a questionable name, but so does the hurdy gurdy and that and that's a beautiful instrument. Yeah. Just one just one that um that looks that looks more like a it looks more like an engineer's nightmare than what people would consider an instrument. But there you mm -hmm. go. Um, 
edit. But the, but the argument for sci-fi and D and D, I think, is settled with exactly what you mentioned. You know, the expedition to the barrier peaks. You know, you're talking about a module is put out. 80, 81, 80, what was it, 80, 81? Let, I'm put out. But Gary Gygax wrote it, you know, and I would think that if you have one of the founders of Dungeon and Dragons, 80. you know, writing a module, 80, okay, um, writing a module that has elements of science fiction in it, then I, I think that that settles the argument of does sci-fi and D D mix well if you if you look at a lot of those pulp stories especially the ones that came out of weird tales like in the in the 50s mm -hmm. the line between fantasy and sf gets real blurry yeah well look at star trek i mean star trek alone has elements of fantasy heavily into it you know and and, and westerns because because yeah. The whole wagon train to the stars thing was meant to be a, was meant to be a way to con the network. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but now with it, with Interstellar, would was that something that was something that you that you and your you and your group were were tooling around, were tooling around with on its own before you decided to make it a rule set, or was it born of a different origin story? Um, Interstellar originally i was going to make it a card game um a card based game I, I i wanted to put out a role what i considered a role playing game in a deck you know where you didn't have to lug around all the heavy books i know there's magic out there i'm aware of that i know about, i wasn't you know, to, if i'm being honest that magic wasn't the first thing that came to mind the first thing that came to mind was the um saga system oh yeah like um dragonlance fifth age and yep. marvel adventure Yep. But I, after looking at it and everything and thinking, you know, I think there's a lot more room for rich storyline, for rich background in a role playing game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why initially we decided we were going to do not only a core role book, but we're going to do a system, um, basically a campaign setting for it. Which allows us to kind of get really deep into the rich history of what happened on Earth, what happened among you know the planets in our solar system, and all of that, because Interstellar does not take place, you know, in other solar systems. It's it's kind of locked into our own. Yeah, and speaking of, speaking of that, I know I know you mentioned Blade Runner, but given the given the whole locked within our own within our own relative solar system. Mm -hmm. Was 2001 an influence? Probably subconsciously because I love the movie and I love the sequel to it. You know, 2010, Year We Made Contact. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big sci-fi geek. I loved Star Wars, you know, Star Wars and the, the Flash Gordon that was made in the 80s. Um, you know... Uh, you know, 2001 a space odyssey 2010 year we make contact i mean you know i think when you when you develop a game you know no matter the genre i think that you cannot help but be influenced by the things that you were exposed to and I, and I think that's the reason why games like this are so popular with us adults is because it harkens back to when we were kids you know mm -hmm. something that was warm feeling and safe and fun yeah, I can I can get that, um, and and ad admittedly, when it comes when it comes to <laughs> when it comes when it comes to S when it comes to SF, I I will freely I will freely admit that given my given my age, I kind of jumped I kind of jumped on things late. Um, I w when there was all the debates about whether or not Star Wars or Star Trek was better, I was the weirdo who said. Why can't we have both? Mm -hmm. I've always been that way. Like, what does it matter? They both. No, I, your, I took it one step further. I wanted, I wanted to. I wanted to kit bash both of them together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the thing is, that's exactly what happens when, and and it's not just me as a creator and as a publisher. I think it's any company that does this. When you have a creative team and they're doing something, 
you know, everybody that touches it has their influences. You know, you you might have a member of your group that's a Trekkie. You might have someone who's a hardcore Star Wars fan. You might have somebody who's a hardcore, you know, pulp sci-fi fan, you know, like Buck Rogers and such, um, or that real dark, you know, that back 1930s, you know, sci-fi nor, you know, Buck Rogers, the original one and such. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think no matter who you are, the move pick on sci-fi. If you're developing a science fiction based game, unless you're doing a direct copy of something, you are being influenced heavily by what you grew up with. I think if you're creating anything, period, you're go- you're going to be influenced either by things that you grew up with or things that had a strong impression on you. Absolutely. Uh, one of my one of my favorite Star Trek stories, and this is a, as far as behind the scenes stories is. The story of Harv Bennett, who what who was producer for the Wrath of Khan. Before he took on the job, which the sole reason he took it was because he could maintain a budget, and the first Wrath film went Khan. over budget. Yeah, uh, the best star or best Star Trek movie made. Yeah, <laughs> but here, here's where here's here's the interesting thing to me. Um, Harv Bennett beforehand had never seen a single episode of Star Trek. In preparation, he bl- he went through the entire original series. May have watched the animated series as well. I I kind of I kind of doubt it. The animated series was weird. <laughs> even if it did give us the even if it did give me the meme of Kirk as a jerk. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it also ge- it also gave me the giant clones. So, eh, Mulligan. But. The the fact that he, the fact that you're able to get something that le- that level of good um, from somebody who up until that point had not seen a single episode, mm-hmm. and admittedly there admittedly there was that whole thing where G- where people got pissed off at the idea of ki- at, of killing off Sp- of killing off Spock, and instead of getting rid of it, it got doubled and shifted. Mm-hmm. But even now taking taking that into into account given the given those um inspirations i'm cur- i'm curious what sort of what i know you mentioned gamma world which mm-hmm. is a weird beast in and of itself yes but in terms of wanting in terms of wanting to go with a with a um essentially a sp- essentially a localized space opera in role playing game form were there any other ma- were there any major influences that would probably fill out your appendix end when it comes to role when it comes to science fiction role playing games? You know, besides most likely the movies I grew up with, mm-hmm. um, like I said, a little bit of Gamma World, a little bit of Star Frontiers, um, you know, of course Star Trek, Star Wars. Um, that's pretty much it. You know, I. And, and, and it's going to sound kind of weird, but the the one thing that I think also influenced me, and that was the Game of Thrones books. And I and I know it's throwing you're going to throw you for a loop when I say that, but um, proceed. <laughs> um, I'm curious yeah, how where this is yeah, going to go. Well, because what I like about Martin is, and and this is kind of like why I really enjoy role playing games, and I and I like especially places you know. Movies like Blade Runner Mm -hmm. is because, you know, in real life, X does not always mark the spot. The princess is not always rescued. And, you know, you don't always, you know, you know, you don't always find the gold. You know what I mean? And, and Martin classically writes that way, you know, um, you know, most, most storylines and and most, I'm I'm not, I don't want to use the word way they game now, but a lot of people like their games very simple. They like their games to start off. Okay, we start off the adventure. Yeah, we're gonna have some bad things happen in the middle, but at the very end, I want I, I want I, my my character better better live. Martin throws it all up. Martin says, "I don't care who the character is; they're up for the chopping block." Blade Runner. How I plug Blade Runner into this is that Blade Runner kind of takes that idea of this dark, dystopian kind of. You know, it's a horrible. You know, it, it's it's not a happy world. 
you know, and and as you're looking at the fortunate people in there, you almost get the impression they're not even happy with what they have. And that's kind of what influenced Interstellar is I wanted to create a a world or a or a um, solar system that did not follow the common tropes, you know. You know, no, there was never a big world war. No, there was not a pestilence of disease. You know, I'm trying, I was trying to break away from these common tropes that people just get hanged up in no matter what, sci-fi. It's kind of, it takes, once you say it takes place in the future, you can bet, well, let me guess, there was a big, or, you know, the big war on Earth or, you know, the aliens invaded and, just, you know, destroyed mankind or there was a big disease. I mean, those are the three big ones for me that I see. And I just wanted something different. And so I kind of look at, I look at Star Trek and I look at movies like, like Blade Runner. And I look at, you know, other TV shows and movies that like, like you mentioned, you know, um, 2000, 2001 Space Odyssey and 2010, you remake Contact. And I'm like, wh what did I like about it? Why can't why can't I take that and throw it all into a blender, turn the blender on, and make my own setting? And given now, when it comes to when it comes to Trek, when it comes to Trek, um, what I find what I find interesting with with that is some of the, so the some of the ways that Trek has been interpreted through the years, some of including some of the more controversial to those who have have this idea that Roddenberry had th had this edict that should not be altered. I'm specifically mm -hmm. referring to what ha what happened after he was kicked upstairs. You know, yeah. the like the stuff with with um, Next Generation after the first two seasons, which admittedly are really really rough, mm -hmm. or a lot of the stuff that was done with Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. Especially, especially with what you brought up with Martin, that's what immediately came to mind, um, and in particular, um, Deep Space Nine because of the Dominion War story arc, mm -hmm. which I know, I know, kind of goes into that whole Great War thing. But we, but um, it is, but seeing seeing that particular war and how it is, it 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 is not a. Not a one, not a one-sided, not a one-sided affair in the slightest, is what ca is what came to mind for me, especially episodes like in the Pale Moonlight, where Cisco ended up having to commit several crimes just to, for just to get the Romulans on their side instead of on the Dominions. Well, well, yeah. The thing is, is I think that you know. What makes good sci-fi to me is sci-fi that is, you know, it's not only visually stimulating, but it's something that you can watch and you can believe. You know, that's that's kind of why I'm not a fan of the newer Star Trek movies. Because the newer Star Trek movies take place supposedly before the original series. And but they look so more advanced. And I, and I look at that and I'm like, what did they like? Did they take a severe downturn in technology and the way it looks and such? I mean, I know that might be considered me being a purist, but again, you know, you go to, you go to the Martin, you know, you know, factor in, in, in gaming in, in world creation. And that is, you know, in life, bad things happen. They do. And bad things happen to good people. And bad guys do, at the end of the day, sometimes win, whether you like it or not. And those are tropes that you don't find classically in movies. You don't find them in TV. You don't find them anywhere like that. I mean, even in writing. And um, I think with a role-playing game, because a role-playing game is very open-ended, mm -hmm. you know, um, so you can't control what happens at the end of the game, so to speak. But what you can do is you can give your players the basic tools and the basic bones to make sure that they understand that there's a history here. 
you know, like, like in this game with, you know, what happened to earth and such, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, there, there's a history and I tried to make things that are based on the history, things that people can look at and say, Oh, I can see that actually happening a hundred years from now. I can see it happening 50 years from now. Absolutely. And take and with that with that kind of thing in mind, I mentioned this before we went live, but science fiction is creating a science fiction world is often a series of questions that lead into more questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the big ones that I all that I always ask is how interplanetary tra inter interplanetary travel would work in that particular um, system. Is it a, is it a case where there's um, is it a case where there's FTL? Is it a case where it's um, where it's set, where it's um, jump, where it's a jump system? Is it is it somewhere in between? Is there not is there not FTL and it takes several years to go between planets? How how would it exactly work out? Okay, in Interstellar, basically, um, you know, to kind of give kind of like the the. All right, you have to first understand something about the game. Is the game is not a system that uses like Star Wars and Star Trek phasers and laser guns. Okay. Um, I think you saw from some of the weapons that I sent you, the schematics. Yeah. You know, there's there are, you know, portable rail guns. There are, you know, weapons that you know, they fire projectiles. They they fire like Again, harken back to what's believable to me, you know. Um, interplanetary travel is actually performed by what are called matter full generators. And basically, um, one of the main ships in the game, one of the largest ships in the game that you can do, um, it's basically a research ship called the RS-400. And what that is, is um, it's, it was originally designed for Earth, or Earth to Mar Mars travel. And it was considered a long haul starship. And basically, um, what they do is they were used to reach the outer reaches area of the solar system, such as Pluto, um, up into the Kuiper Belt. And they were designed to go on 10 year missions. And what they have is they have a matter folding generator connected to them. And what it does is it pretty much folds mm -hmm. space. So again, you know, we're gonna we're gonna harken back to again another movie that I seen. Um, oh, what is the name of that movie? Uh, Sam Neill starred in it. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Yeah, I know. It's a sci-fi movie. They have the generator in the back that opens up a portal to the bad world. Um, I'm drawing the Event blade. Horizon? Yes, Event Horizon. I like the, the thought of, a, of folding space. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in this game you know, it doesn't do bad things. So basically that's how they can go ahead and they can go long distances for a very short amount of times. But these ships um, actually have um, limitations. Like as an example, these matter folding generators um, only work a certain amount of times, you know, so to speak on a, on a, um, with their generator. And there's only a couple places that do the fuel that these things need in order to do this. And in the game, I mean, without giving away too much, I mean, people will see when the campaign settings out, but there's actually um, portable matter full generators that smaller ships that don't have these connected to it can use. So you can go very far distances very quickly using these, um, but there are limitations to them and then of course in the game there's the mechanic that when you use this there is a chance that you know you could program your computer wrong there could be an error there could be a malfunction and you might end up not where you want to go so um those are those back end mechanics into the world though all right i i can i can certainly get behind that and i seem to recall that dune also had a a space folding setup as well Yes. And and Dune, I think, influenced me 
um, in the sense that in, in Dune, you have spice, of course. That helps them fold space. But in in my book, um, or in my book, in my, in my sci-fi, basically what ends up happening is um, what has happened to Earth is um, basically humans just due to neglect, due to, you know, ignoring things, you know, believe it, whatever you want to believe, but like global warming, that type of stuff. Um, Earth has become basically a very overpopulated planet. Um, the planet's made up of just large, massive cities. And, er and oxygen is in short supply. It's actually a commodity. And mm -hmm. um, there are large oxygen scrubbers and generators all over the planet. So Earth is not a very nice place to live. Um, so there you're touching kind of like the Blade Runner thing. Mm -hmm. um, so basically there is a... Um, a reliance on a on a on, it's basically an element called chromium and chromium is only mined in one place and that's on io one of the moons of jupiter mm -hmm. and you have to understand something about the way this game works um when you start playing interstellar and you pick what species you are um, you have to choose your home guild and your guild will be based on what planet so you know jupiter is a guild you know, the moon is a guild. You know, the moons of Jupiter are are minor guilds. And then you have Pluto. I mean, all the planets have their are, are basically their own guilds. And what guilds are is they're controlled by the species that lives there. And they have their own unique rules, their own unique laws, that type of thing. But this chromium is what drives everybody because chromium is an element that actually helps produce oxygen and make oxygen. Mm -hmm. So io is considered guild neutral but of course as with anything of course there's there's it's not as guild neutral as what you know players well you know obviously would pretty much i know and, and learn yeah. so um again the 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 game is heavily backstory it's very rich um for each guild, there's an extensive background on it, how the guild was formed, the history of the guild, what the guilds, you know, each guild has its own unique things that it does. You know, some guilds produce technology. Some guilds are good for weapon type, you know, weapons. Some guilds, you know, are good for mining certain elements that are needed throughout the game because there's other things that are needed element-wise. Mm-hmm. And I'm guess just a, just in a ballpark thing when it comes to the topic of folding space. Mm -hmm. uh, I going from say Earth to the Moon, or in some settings they want to call it Luna. Mm -hmm. How long would how long would that take on average? Well, like as an example, um, let me pull up the ship. I can actually give you stats. Um, all right, um, the the Gazetteer, which is one of the long haul um, starships. Mm -hmm. um, the little bit of background, you know, it's got a crew of thirty two. Um, it's six hundred ninety eight feet long, ninety eight feet um, tall on average, seventy two feet wide. Um, it's powered by nuclear core generators with plasma gen with plasma generator system, and then it has four matter folding generators with two folds possible so it has the ability to go out far and then you use your second fold to come back so um the average and again you have to factor in some things here the average max or the maximum speed on this ship we're not talking about um using the fold generators the the, the maximum speed is about 300,000 kilometers an hour. So you're looking at about 186,400 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, definitely can get to the moon fairly fast. Um, that's why you wouldn't use something like the full generator, probably travel to the moon, because you're only probably talking a day to get there at that speed or whatnot. Yeah. Um, now, to go out to places like Pluto and to go to places like that, 
under a standard drive, a ship like this would take about a year and a half mm -hmm. at that speed. Um, the uh, matter, you know, the matter fold generators um, can literally take you there within minutes. I mean, it literally folds space. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to go to Jupiter versus how long would it take to go to Jupiter using a matter fold generator versus going to Pluto? Probably within seconds, maybe maybe a few minutes of each other because the way matter fold generators work. I know you mentioned that the settlements across the solar system referred to as guilds, and yes. it's clear it's clear that several of the moons al along the gas giants have have their own guilds. Yes. Are there is there a guild like or similar presence within the asteroid belt, or is it just yes. too volatile? Nope, right through the Kuiper belt. Yes. And given the, is it a case where the where um. The where the larger asteroids are, are are like that, or is it a case of a bunch of mini settlements all over the belt? There are well, there are non-sanctioned guilds. They're 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 called wild card settlements. They're throughout the asteroid belt, and those are very small. You know, um, for lack of a better word, they're kind of like wild wild west. You know, out there. Mm -hmm. So, there are not guilds that are formally accepted or recognized. They're kind of like their own wild system out there. It's akin to outlaw promotions. Hmm. You, you, there, there are definitely outlaws out there. That's yeah. the whole point of it. It's, it's, it's a wild no man's land out there the asteroid belt yeah and you know whereas even though some guilds are very corrupt in the solar system and some guilds are depending on how you roll as a character and how you or how you are as a character and what you want to be and how you want to act there's some guilds out there that that you may not um think are very you know nice or civilized even but there is they they do follow some basic laws you know um you know tenants if you will mm -hmm. and out in the asteroid belt they don't follow anything anything can happen there's piracy that happens out there they actually come in from the asteroid belt and they try to hijack ships and you know the problem is you know guilds are very very compartmentalized so if i'm a member of a guild and your ship is is taken unless it in some way interferes with our plans or our needs or our wants um we don't care i mean you handle it so it's it's very you know you might say that it's just kind of like a i don't want, I don't want to use the word wild west but maybe that just fits in a lot of ways with it i'd say i'd say it fits better than i'd say it's the closest one because when I think of No Man's Land, I think of the No Man's Land that was in the First World War. Yes. And that isn't quite that isn't quite accurate. To oh, what to I mean by No Man's Land, to 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 phrase what what goes on out there better is, you know, the the Kuiper Belt, the Asteroid Belt, and such. Um, it's just an area where the normal laws don't apply. And if you're going to venture out there, um, you know, you you are taking great risk. But again, you know, there's there's parts of the game, like as an example, um, where there are there are settlements out there that are very very, for lack of a better word, um, they mine certain unique elements that are not available in our own solar system. Mm -hmm. So. You know, in the game, you might be forced to go out there, or maybe in the game, you might be um, forced to travel out there and, you know, deal with a problem or whatnot, or deal with a, you know, with a, um, with, you know, one of these wild card guilds. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, 
I usually I realize that the ga I realize that the game is in a bit is in a bit of flux since you guys are dealing with um, layout at the moment. Yes. But what can you tell me about the about the core mechanic and a bit of um a bit of character creation? Because well, I kept getting the vibe that it's a D one hundred approach. Nope, it's a D twenty. Okay. Oh, oh. Well then. It's a D twenty approach. What we have is we have a thing called the task level system. And basically what the task level system is, um, we actually, I, or I actually created a task level system back in 2007. Um, I actually had that in a small fantasy RPG that I self-published that I didn't do anything with it. Um, but it, you basically have two very simple tables. And, you know, each task is basically assigned, you know, you know, let, let me, I can actually give you kind of a really nice breakdown even for you um, in this. But basically, each thing that you want to do now, whether that is going ahead and trying to, um, you know, hijack, you know, and, you know, um, and hijack a starship, you're trying to pick a digital lock, you're trying to, you know, hack a computer and whatnot. Everything is a task, and each task has a level of difficulty. Mm -hmm. And when you create your character, um, and you are, and what, what, let me back up. When you create your character, um, as you develop, you will gain basically skills that will will allow you to become better at doing tasks. They give you modifiers. So, as an example, let's say you're trying to hack into a computer and you have the skill hacking, basic hacking. Um, let's say you're dealing with a computer that is difficult. That may, and, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm going off the top of my head here because I don't have my notes for that in front of me, but you know, it may have a difficulty skill, you know, task level rating of let's say 15. And as a, with a skill of basic hacking, you might have a modifier of one. And then due to maybe your agility score, um, you have, you know, you're, you're very, very, you have high agility and you have high intelligence, so you kind of know better what you're doing. You might have an additional plus one or plus two. So you take those modifiers, minus them from the 15, and you have the D20 roll that you have or higher in order to go ahead and uh, uh, hack the computer properly. Mm-hmm. Now, with the so is it a, is it a case where all where all roads lead to the it lead to the D twenty? The D twenty is the primary dice that you're going to use in um, Interstellar. Um, it is the primary driving dice. Um, the other time, the only time that you'll get into and we involve a D one hundred is when you do. Um, starship to starship combat. You'll switch to a D100. All right. And with both the D20 and D100, with the D100, is it going to be aim low or aim high? Um, well, with the D20 system, <laughs> that we have the task level system, again, you know, all of these, all of these task levels, you know, whether they're, whether they're, you know, easy, difficult, hard, you know, heroic or whatever, you know, they are all up high. You know, they start off high. And then the idea is, is through your skill set and through your attribute bonuses, um, what you'll do is, and through buying skill, or not buying, by acquiring skills, those modifiers will bring that down. So on a D20, you always want to roll the highest you can. And then with the with our D100 combat between ships, um, the way that will work is is there's factors in for distance and that type of thing, and each ship has um, each ship has various um, uh, stats for weapons. Each weapon has a distance they can fire um, based on the distance. There's there's four levels of distance, and each level of distance has a modifier. Your ship size, your ship size rating also will affect it because 
that gives you a modifier like an armor class if you will for for using a D term if we will mm -hmm. <laughs> um i'm trying to explain this in a way that average players right off the bat can understand it so um that's where d100 comes into play because there's a lot of weapons out there that are very long range and then there's weapons like the old-fashioned broadside cannons that you got to get right close to the other ship and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, two systems within one. Um, they're both extremely easy to learn. You know, you can sit. We we actually have a quick start guide that's going to be in the beginning of the book, and literally, if you read it, you can play the game. And the entire quick start guide is a page and a half. And that's including tables. Now, with a lot of um, SF games I've seen, they tend to be fairly freeform and rely on sk and rely on a skill system. Is mm -hmm. Interstellar going to be in that category? <clears throat> Interstellar is a well. Interstellar does rely on skills. I mean, you pick up skills throughout the game. You have you have to be able to do something. Um, but also along with that, you know, you can become, based on what you start off as, you know, you can be a human, a synthetic, or an alien. Mm -hmm. And those right there have limitations as to, you know, how far you can go in a certain skill. You know, then your attributes come into play. Um, so, yes, it, I would say that it is a, as far as a skill-based system, um I would say yes, because you have to have something driving the technical nature of science fiction. Yeah, and I should note when I meant when I mentioned a skill-based system, I'm referring to the majority of your tests, checks, whichever whichever term you prefer, um, being based on um, on a on a given skill. Actually, they're more they're more and. What matters more, I think, in the game is the 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 task that you're trying to complete. Okay, and in combat's a task. If yeah. I have a if I have a gun and I'm trying to shoot you, that's a task I'm trying to complete. Same thing if I'm trying to hijack a ship, you know, hack a computer, you know, throw a hand grenade, whatever. Um, so, but what really is the driver is the task difficulty level. You know, how hard is the thing that you're trying to do? You know, you're you're trying to you're trying to do a very specific task. How hard is that? And then at that point is when your skills and your attributes come into play. Because if you're if you're as an example, just a you know, a first level character, if you will, and you're trying to do something extremely complicated then probably you're not going to have a chance because even when you add your attributes to it and even when you add your um, your uh, skill you know, modifiers to it, the, 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 the role may be still over 20. So you're not even going to be able to do it. Yep. So, you know, the idea behind it, and again, I want to go back, harken back to that whole, you know, princess is not always rescued, good guy does not always win, that type of thing is... Yeah, you know, there'll be things in this game that you want to try to do, but you can't just because you don't have the ability yet to do it. Which certainly, ma which certainly makes sense. Yes, to me it does as a, as a player. I mean, it's like in D and D. The way I modified my A D and D game was, is I thought to myself, and again, I'll go the Gandalf principle. Why can't a magic user in AD and D use a sword? Why not? Or for that, or for that, the th the thing that I've brought up when it comes to the whole when it, when it comes when it comes to that sort of thing is uh, oddly enough, oddly enough, one the opposite, and two, um, I've resented this idea that ma that um that martial that martial characters have to be gimped. Or yep. have to be this one-trick pony, which leads to the stereotype of, and I've talked about this elsewhere, the stereotype of the fighter being Babby's first character, or yeah. the or the char the character that you get that you give the newbie to, who's just who's mm -hmm. just supposed to sit around and do basic attack all day, 
and that's a, and that's supposed to be stimulating. Meanwhile, you've got the thief who's got their thief skills, the cleric who's got everything, and the and the wizard who ha, who can end an entire encounter with one spell. Yeah, that's like why in we we have a role playing game, fantasy role playing game that we were going to put out this year, but we're actually we moved Interstellar up ahead. We're going to do the fantasy RPG um, either later on in the fall or the first part of next year. Mm-hmm. And in our in our in our RPG we're putting out, basically what happens is anyone can try anything. A, a, a fighter can pick up spell casting as a skill. He's allowed to pick up spell casting. He's limited how far he can go in it, but he sure as hell can try and maybe pick up a few first level or second level spells. Maybe, um, I we kind of took the reins of that off and said, you know, you know, what's wrong with a fighter being able to learn to pick locks? Why can't a, why can't he have that skill? Why can't a fighter, you know, especially when you look at user... martial characters in fiction, like let's look yeah. let's look at um. Let's look at Conan, and I'm specifically referring to Conan not as he's portrayed in the in the Arnold movies or in the Momoa movie, but in the but in the novels by Robert E. Howard, and both and the primary comic book runs, first the and even more so, the Marvel comic book run by John Buscema. Mm-hmm. He's not just a barbarian; he's a thief. He's a pirate. He's been he's been a he's been a king he's been a he's been an adventurer and has, and um just trying to adapt I remember trying to adapt him into rifts not rifts um gurps and the amount of skills I had to account for I needed a bigger character sheet yeah and same thing applies when when they've tried to stat Conan in say mongoose Conan D twenty mm-hmm. um just he's somebody who's You've got some. You've got somebody who's picked up all these different tricks from all from all over the place. Um, you try and adapt, say Sherlock Holmes. Well, while most people will focus on the detective thing, people often forget that he's a, he is a proficient stick fighter. Mm-hmm. And that and um that and that's something that should that should be taken into account. Just because there are just because there are roles does not mean that you can't that you can't have those roles be multi-purpose in a role-playing game. Yes, and and the thing is, is you know, I think that it's very important that I think that you have to have, um, you know, you have to have guidelines, if you will. You have mm-hmm. to have, um, you know, checks and balances in a game. Yeah, you don't want but, analysis but, paralysis. Exactly. But the one thing that you want to make sure is, is also is, I think, and this is just my thinking as a game developer and as a game player, I've been playing for a couple of years, mm-hmm. is the games I look back that I had the most fun, especially like in D&D, um, I'll harken back to our, our teacher, Sepich. Mr. Sepich bought a DMG and a PHB and he heavily modified them. And then he took his typewriter, made a condensed version of the game, went to the office, you know, cranked out, you know, the, the copies, you know, the you know the smelly alcohol-based ink that you know you smell the paper when you pick it up, mm-hmm. you know, and um, that was a heavily modified version of D and D. It's not what we played among my buddies, but that was his that was his game. It that kind of that kind of thing is in good company because. That's how um that's how stuff like Rollmaster was made. Yes. It started out as a bunch of AD and D house rules and then just evolved into it into its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, um Chivalry and Sorcery was cr- was created because the guy behind it felt that D and D didn't do the whole do the medieval aspect well enough for him. So if you want mm-hmm. something done right, you gotta do it yourself. <laughs> yes. Um now with the now take taking all that in taking all that into account. Um when when it comes I've I obviously one of one of the big um and one of the big entries when it comes to space opera is Traveler and its infamous life path system. 
-hmm. when it comes to character creation do you have a do you do you have a means of integrating the background of say of say or of say early careers or early life of characters i'm not saying full-on yeah. life path but something similar. yes within the game basically part of your character creation is optional you don't have to do it but there is a what we call um uh oh darn i'm kind of drawing a blank because you're you're, you're asking me some good questions here our system that we use Oh, I can't find it. At any rate, I was having my manual open that I was doing. Um, what it allows you to do is you can go ahead and you can create kind of a backstory in your character. Um, there's guidance, like as an example, as a human synthetic or alien, if you're a synthetic, um, there is a there's limitations to it because synthetics are very unique because they're human created beings that eventually became sentient. But um there's broad room in the game to create a detailed backstory. That's part of your guild that you have to select also. So, you know, when you select your guild, there's a whole lot of stuff that comes along with it. You know, um, you know, characters and, and characters can become rogue, but a guild is basically a safe haven for a character. And, you know, if you break the guild's rules while in play, that your ability to, to go back to your gilding and get aid and help is hindered, you know, by your own actions. But also, you can go through and you can do a basic background on your character. Um, there's things that you can select within the game that affect that. And based, if you're going to do a detailed um, background on your character there's actually the ability that you could actually affect certain types of skills that you have. So what you have is um, within the game, when you're, when you're playing interstellar, um, you basically start off with a certain amount of points based upon your rate, your, your species and along with your species, your ability stats. So you start off with a, with a, a core group of points that you can spend on skills mm -hmm. so that's that's the basis for the entire game your background does come into play but it comes into play more importantly by what guild that you select All right, that's because that's different guilds sense. have different 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 backstories themselves mm -hmm. now one now um what do you sh i know i know it's hard to answer this because of, because of the fact that you guys are in the layout phase at this moment, but how 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 big of a core book do you see the do you see the core rules being? Do you th do you think you're going to be around a hundred pages, or do you think you're going to be higher than that? Actually, the the core rule book um, is actually going to probably be right around a hundred hundred and twenty pages. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to make it it you know the thing is the core rule book is just your rules, your skills, you know. The, the real, real, besides, I mean, that's a very, very important, you know, cog, you know, in, in the machine. But, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the game's system setting, which is basically our solar system, mm -hmm. um, that I think is a lot more richer. So you're going to have that, and that actually comes in, and, and this is going to be another thing. The game is going to come in a box. Oh, we're doing box two, sets. Yep, there's going to be a box with two hardcover books in it. And in the box, along with the two hardcover books, there's going to be a system map. Mm -hmm. And also there's going to be a soft cover, um, weapons and equipment, basically a technology manual. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing I'm guess I'm guessing the way weapons are going to be set up is similar to the weapon schematics that you've you've po you shared with me and you've posted on Twitter. Yes. Uh, which feels like, feels like it's trying to re maybe I'm not sure if this was the intent, but it feels like it's trying to replicate the sch the schematic that you might see of uh when it comes to the firearms. That, yes, the, I, like the kind of schematic um, you'd see for an actual firearm. 
Yes, I wanted it as real as possible, as technical as possible. Um, I wanted it, I want, let me back up. I wanted it very technical looking, but very easy to understand. And I wanted them to be the type of thing you could look at and say, oh, you know, on the VP36 pistol, the safety makes sense where it's at. Mm-hmm. Oh, the battery mag release. I can see that right there. You know, like, you know, you're, you're moving your thumb, you know, um, and again, you know, the big thing with the weapons are, as you can see, you know, they're, you know, you might want to call them, you know, they're, they're martial based projectile based weapons. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, we have rocket launchers and rail guns and pistols and, you know, hand grenades. And I don't know if I sent it to you, but we have, um, there's a group of humans called dwellers. And what they are is they live on the lowest parts of the cities on earth. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of like, um, for lack of a better word, take a little bit of Escape from New York, the movie, that kind of Wild West Manhattan-type environment. But the higher you get, the more civilized it gets. Yeah. And there's a thing called a Dweller Special. It's a pistol. And it's very rough-looking. It's very... Um, it, very it, uh, looks like it, it looks like the the hack together pistols that you might see in fallout yes or or even i'd say even the um stuff like stuff like the guns some of the stranger firearms you'd see in the metro games yes yes which cer- certainly makes sense it's like and if i want if i wanted to hit even more home so ba- so basically it's a sten <laughs> Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's a it's a cobbled together pistol that um, when you look at it, you can tell that it was just kind of cobbled together from what they can go ahead and 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 get together. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever get a picture of it? Um, the dw- the dweller pistol? No. Yes. No that the means- th- the three ones that you sent me were the um, Steiner Park um, assault pistol. Yeah, the the angler the angler tech pistol. Yeah, the angler and, tech. Yeah, angler and the Steiner Park um, rocket launcher. Yep. And the angler tech EMP grenade. Yes. Basically, um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to wrap this around. Um, you know, there's manufacturers out there. Mm-hmm. You know that that make this stuff and. Let me real quick. I'm gonna go ahead and drop you an email. I'll just drop it to you in Discord. That yep. way you can see it, and that way it's it's. Uh... All right. I will. I will keep it. I will keep an eye out for it. Um, it's coming right now. Although, oddly, oddly enough, one. <laughs> Yeah, that that looks like that looks like um the, that looks like the bastard child of a of a fl- of a flare gun, and yep. <laughs> and and <laughs> something something I'd see two hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's ve- it's very clearly it's very, I'd say it's like, say it's like the bastard child of a flare gun and a derringer, yep. except it's probably okay. not the size of a derringer. Um. But I can I can see I can see what you mean what you mean when you when it's when it's called cobbled, um, yep. and as a bit of an aside, I've learned I've learned that if I want to take it if I want to take to to take or steal ideas to make um sci-fi looking weapons, I just have to look at get I just have to look at firearm designs from Caltech. <laughs> yeah. Cause, Every single one of their designs is ugly, but they do. Yeah, it, but that's the thing. I mean, I, I wanted the weapons of Interstellar. You know, I, you know, again, I could have made you know very sleek looking laser pistols like in Star Trek and and such. Um, but I just look at our future and I think to myself, you know, I could see some of these weapons in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's. A good, I'll tell you, another one that was hugely impactful was the new Battlestar Galactica series. I, I can certainly see it. You know, I love the fact that they used 
a phone to pick up to talk between shifts. I love the fact that they did not have laser pistols. They actually used rifles and, and you know, the ships fired a nuclear warhead at each other. I mean, I just love the... A you lot, know, you look at, mm-hmm. a I mean, lot I just of... love the whole, the whole idea yep. behind it. It was probably one of the best sci-fi series. Um, I have, I mean, my opinion, I'm going to catch a lot of shit flack over this. I know I am, but I admit, I, in my opinion, it's probably one of the finest science fiction TV series I've ever seen. It's funny you bring that up because that one and Deep Space Nine both share the same writer. Um, yes. Ron Moore, who there's a there's a lengthy interview he did with El Cars where he kind of voiced his frustrations with the way things were going with Trek and how it, and some of the sameness that he that he that he felt was um, all over the place. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in um go, and his version of Battlestar Galactica that's kind of his response to that issue. You know, start in Trek. There's in, Trek doesn't have religion in in bat in Battlestar Galactica. They do. You mm-hmm. have you have a bridge that looks more that looks more like more like the bridge you'd see on a you'd see on a navy ship than the car than the carpeted affairs you'd see on a lot of sh- on a lot of um Star Trek ships. Yes. Um, you ha- you have the you have the um fact that messages are going through those those um. Re- those rectangular like approaches um mm-hmm. the instead instead of full on shuttles you ha- you have the vi- you have the no fr- no frills fighters in the form of viper and you have the f- you have the fact that a lot of the lead characters are extremely flawed instead of the flawless we've evolved past our- we've evolved past conflict kind of mindset that gene mm-hmm. was insistent on um I mean, Adam. I mean, Adam. Adama is some is the is not the, not somebody you'd want, not somebody you'd want to get on their bad side to say the least. Mm-hmm. This is the, this is because keep in mind, if in the miniseries, his approach to dealing with a Cylon was beat it to death with a flashlight until it stops moving. But the thing is, you look at what I, what I really enjoyed about Battlestar Galactica also was the fact that they, when you were watching it at the time, they implemented a lot of like, a lot of modern day events that kind of incorporated into the series and did a twist to them. And I, I just liked the whole vibe off the whole thing. It was just, it was, it was dirty and grungy and, and gritty and, you know, just just an excellent, well done series. Yep. I didn't like how it ended. I admit the ending was kind of anticlimactic for me. Um, you know, sorry, Game of Thrones, the TV series. Again, I love the entire series. The last episode was kind of like a, you know, dun dun, you know, <laughs> type thing. But you know, overall, really loved it. Yeah. Um, I decided to refamiliarize my, myself with. With some of the with some of the firearms in it, and the, um, just the colonial blaster looks like some looks like something you'd see you'd see straight out of Blade Runner, so I can mm-hmm. see where that, um, that connective tissue is at play. But are you plan are you planning on doing a full on release later later on in the year, or are you planning on doing a cr- a crowdfund or something similar down the line? For Interstellar. Yes. It's out. It's it is being released in May. All all right. And I'm doing a we're doing a full on release in May. Yeah, and that's is that going to be for both physical and um, PDF? Yes. All right. I I can cer- I can certainly get behind that. Have you have you guys um, considered reaching out to certain um, virtual tabletops like Foundry or Mythic Ta- or Mythic Table? We have not yet. Um, we have just got done cementing and we did a joint project with Tim Cask from, um, TSR of days of old. Mm -hmm. And we did a board game called D20 delving. It's actually coming out later on this month. Um, fingers crossed. And we are, um, he's basically, we have barcode, you know, QR codes on the cards Mm -hmm. and 
the player can scan the QR code and hear Tim read the card to him. <laughs> it's really cool. He has a really cool voice for that. Um, and actually, tonight, I have a meeting after this interview. I have to meet with him um, online, and we're going to discuss. We're doing some other projects together now. So um, the big emphasis we're doing right now as a company is when we can, we want to implement this technology of bringing a bringing QR codes in that people that have problems with their eyesight can scan mm -hmm. the item um, and hear it read to them so they can be included in certain types of games that maybe they would be precluded from playing before, um, like board games and certain types of other games. We looked at that for Interstellar. Um, it just wasn't practical because the nature of a role-playing game is so wordy, it's so word-intensive. Um, but, you know, things like, uh, implementing with other systems, tabletop systems like that and digital platforms, you know, not at this point, we just want to, we want to kind of take baby steps into this. We want to get our own projects developed first. Um, we're going to put a lot of effort into this, um, QR code auto reading mm -hmm. idea that we had. And we've actually, hey, we already have NPR, interested in interviewing us once we have the game out and um we're actually going to be uh reach not reaching out we've already done it but um we actually have the american council of the blind kind of take a look at it mm -hmm. um and if we can get someone like them to endorse it um that'll do a lot for the board game uh d20 delving and then um other products we're putting out that are card based will all be carrying the qr code system in it as as a as a standard I, I can certainly get behind that. Now, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and and I was going to say braving the hell of time zones, but you and I are in the same time zone, so that so that's out. You're you're Eastern Standard. Um, I'm Central. Ah, then we're not. I'm Eastern. Oh. I'm. Michigan. Oh yeah, I for I forgot. Michigan is one of those we we want to play both sides kind of kind of things regarding time zones. Uh, yeah, when you get up in the UP and you get in it really far western side, you're you're touching. So, mm -hmm. I think I think I think Arizona had a similar thing of not of not knowing which time zone it wants to sit on, so it sits yeah. on both of them. Yeah, oh. but also, you know, I want to thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, um, you're a great. You're really you're a really good interviewer. You do your homework and it shows. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into and in, go into Interstellar or and or any other projects you guys have in the works, the door is always open. Thank you. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> we can get behind that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>